<laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Started that off real good. And, and I should say it certainly is morning uh, here in Oregon, Portland, Oregon, at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. in the morning. I'm sure you've probably heard of people falling asleep during a public talk. Well, you might see the speaker fall asleep during a public talk this morning, <laughs> but I certainly hope not. Hopefully I can keep you all awake. Well, we're really living in critical times, hard to deal with, aren't we? Uh, this pandemic has killed hundreds of thousands of people worldwide, even some of our dear beloved ones, many of our brothers and sisters. It has sent the world's financial system into a tailspin. Uh, leaving hundreds of thousands out of work and uh, causing panic in lives of millions. And many are saying that this pandemic is an act of God. Well, we're going to find out in the portion of this talk about what an act of God is, uh, what it's not, and we're going to see how we can determine what an act of God really is. And then we're going to talk a little bit about an act of God that soon will befall all mankind. First of all, we need to go over a few facts. Uh, did you know that one-third of the world's population claims to be Christian? Uh, and there's over 40,000 different denominations of the Christian religions. And most of them say that all Christian religions worship the same God. Now, we want to make it very clear. We as Jehovah's Witnesses, we are definitely Christians. We recognize Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Uh, we conduct our lives in a way that... Uh, like. Uh, Christ, uh, but we don't agree with that statement that all Christian religions worship the same God. No, our God Jehovah does not take babies to be with their uh, from their mothers to be angels in heaven. Our God does not implant some cancerous tumor or some other disease to test our faith or our loyalty or to see how strong we are spiritually. God would never ever test us in such a way. He would never make us suffer or take our loved ones for such a selfish reason as to be another angel in heaven. When you think about it, God has millions and millions of angels in the heavens. Why would he take the only child of a mother or the only uh, one of few children from a mother and watch her suffer over the loss of a child just so he could have another angel in heaven? God would never, ever test us in such a way. He would never make us suffer in such a way. No, we believe is what the Bible writer said in James chapter 1. Turn with me to James chapter 1. And we encourage all of you to use your Bibles today if you have one, because we want you to see all this from God's word of the Bible. We're going to be referring to many scriptures. But here in James chapter 1, let me just highlight uh, a little bit something about the writer of James. Now, James was a half-brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus as his younger brother. Uh, his mother and father was Mary. And, and Joseph. Uh, these people were chosen by God to be the parents of Jesus Christ as he grew up in this, system, in this wicked system of things. So this was a very spiritual family. Uh, James was around Jesus. He was around Mary. He was around Joseph. They were very spiritual people. And if anybody knew about God, they knew about God. And notice what James says about God in James chapter 1 and verse 13. Notice what he says there. He says, when under trial, let no one say, I am being tried by God. For with evil things, God cannot be tried, nor does he himself try anyone. No, James knew that our God, Jehovah, would never make people suffer indiscriminately. Uh, the faithful man, Job, when he was going through such an awful suffering, at Job uh, 34.10, he said it was uh, unthinkable for the true God to act un uh, wickedly. And remember, Job was uh, suffering. All his suffering didn't come from God. He was being tested by the devil himself. Yes, death and pain and all suffering is a product of sin, brought in by Satan the devil, not God. Yet victims of floods and fires and storms and earthquakes and other disasters, they blame God for the loss of life and property. And in our time, uh, there's been more disasters than any other time in the history of man devastating earthquakes that caused tsunamis, like the one that hit Indonesia in 2004. We all watched in horror how people uh, were drowned and overcome by that tsunami. Hundreds of thousands were killed there. In Japan in 2011, nearly 1,600 were killed, and over 2,500 are still missing. It's estimated that well, there was $250 billion in property lost there. The earthquake that hit Hades in 2010, 
It killed over 200,000 people, many of them our righteous brothers and sisters. Many who survived that uh, earthquake are still homeless there. And recently, even here in the United States, fires, floods, tornadoes, and hurricanes have destroyed and devastated billions of dollars worth of property and taken thousands of lives. People often refer to these catastrophic events as acts of God. So they're blaming God for all the deaths of these innocent people, men, women, and children, and the elderly and infirm. They blame it on God. When these disasters strikes, people often cry out against God. Uh, for example, when Hurricane uh, uh, Katrina hit New Orleans in 2005, it killed 1,800 people. The mayor there said it was because God was punishing them. And remember, old people drown in their beds. A young woman who lost her baby daughter, her only child, in a, in a tornado in Alabama, she said, I know God took my baby, but I don't know why. I don't know why he would take my only child. A woman losing her son after a long and painful, uh, uh, painful injury that he sustained in a tornado. She said, how dare God? How dare God take my son in such a way? You know, it just hurts our hearts to think that people are being taught this by the religious leaders. But where do they get such ideas? Well, they might say, well, the Bible does foretell disasters. Jesus in his prophecy about the conclusion of the system of things, he mentioned food shortages, earthquakes, and pestilence. Uh, the Apostle John foretold food shortages and deadly plagues. But does that mean that God caused such events? just because he prophesied that they would occur? Well, absolutely not. What we must understand is Almighty God is omniscient. Omniscient means that he has universal knowledge or knowledge of all things. He can foretell the outcome of imperfect human endeavors and then state beforehand the result. Notice what's recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 44. And notice what God himself says through the Bible writer Isaiah. Turn me to Isaiah chapter 42, and let's read verse 9 together. There it says, and remember this is God speaking about himself. See, the first things have come to pass. Now I am declaring new things. Before they spring up, I tell you about them. Yes, Almighty God is able to prophesy things before they happen. The definition of prophecy is to state something that will happen in the future based on knowledge. Well, Almighty God has universal knowledge so he can tell by man's actions what will be the final result. However, just because he prophesies the results does not mean he causes them. I'll give you an example, an illustration of that. When Lee and I were serving in Georgia, uh, when we went to the Kingdom Hall, we drove along a rural road. We drove that road often each week. And as we drove down that road, we always seen the same dog running back and forth across the, across the road. So I told Leah, my wife, you know, one of these days we're going to see that dog dead in the street. Well, it wasn't long after that. There that dog was dead in the street. Now, did I prophesy that dog's death? Well, absolutely not. But I did predict that dog's death. Based on that dog's actions, I could tell what uh, uh, the result could be or possibly would be because the definition of prediction is to foretell something that might happen based on observation experience or scientific reasoning yes although i predicted that dog's death i certainly didn't cause that dog's death yes we can by our limited knowledge predict what may happen based on what we know much like a weatherman predicts the weather based on uh, current uh, behavioral patterns of the weather and knowledge of the atmosphere. And now with greater degree of accuracy uh, using Doppler radar and other technology. But we don't blame the weatherman for the weather just because he predicted it. Yes, Almighty God Jehovah has unlimited knowledge of all things. So he is able to pros prophesy what will happen, not just what may or might happen, but what will happen. But just because he can prophesy the results, just as we can predict certain results, does not mean he causes them no more than I caused the death of that dog. 
yet people continue to blame God for these catastrophic events. Many devastating disasters were the results of acts of men, not acts of God. We're going to note three aspects of many disasters recorded in mankind's history, which we will see are definitely acts of men and not acts of God. However, he was blamed for them. The first aspect is humans misuse our natural resources, resources that may abuse the environment, making it more prone for disasters. Back in the early 1900s, uh, there was a great need for wheat throughout the world, especially in Russia. So the American government, they offered land in the Midwest cheap to anyone who would go there and farm the wheat. Hundreds of settlers moved in that area. They stripped the land of all the trees, all the shrubberies, all the rooted plants, plowing straight pharaohs up and down the hills. When the rains came, those plowed pharaohs became like great gullies, taking the topsoil and washing it out to the rivers and the rivers taking it out to sea. Next came the droughts and the blowing winds. The result was the Great Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Farmlands across five states of the Midwestern America were destroyed and devastated. An act of God? No, it was an act of greed. A second aspect of mankind disasters is the way people live their lives and where they live them that make them more vulnerable when disaster strikes. For example, the Yellow River in China, it winds toward the sea like an elevated highway. It is so large and vast, you can see it from outer space. It's a magnificent creation of God. So to hold back the water, to expose the rich farm soil there. Local peasants are forced to live there as cheap labor to farm the land. In times of flood, which happen often there, these dikes sometimes burst, turning the flat plains into a sea of terror. Over the centuries, some 10 million Chinese have died in floods there. Yes, 10 million. Making the Yellow River the cause of more human suffering than any other natural feature on earth. An act of God? Not hardly. Again, an act of man's greed. A third aspect is people often ignore warnings, making results more destructive. People ignore the examples from the past. Like the Yellow River, for instance, they are still building those dikes there as we speak today. People are still dying and drowning by the thousands there every year. In New Orleans, New Orleans is six feet below sea level, and yet they'll build the walls a little bit higher, thinking they're going to hold back these storms that blow the water in there like it's a, just a, a, a soup bowl where people die and drown. Villages and cities are built at the base of volcanoes and all of these places are prone to disaster. Yet people keep building houses there and living in these areas. So clearly humans are often responsible for disasters with heavy loss of life and property. God is not the cause for such calamities. Yet people keep blaming him for them. Well, now we know what's not an act of God, but what is an act of God? Because the Bible does speak of uh, uh, God sending flood water, fire and sulfur and so on to destroy the wicked. Uh, you know, we've, we've not, uh, we're not such a disaster as really acts of God. When you look at those in the Bible, you can see they certainly were acts of God, but not according to mankind's definition. The legal term for act of God by the world's, world standards is defined as an accident that arises uh, from a cause operating without interference or aid from man. However, the events recorded in the Bible were neither accidents nor intended to make people suffer indiscriminately. So that definition is certainly wrong. All genuine acts of God are righteous. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and notice what's recorded there for us about our wonderful God, Jehovah. It tells us a little bit about what kind of God he really is. That's Deuteronomy 32, and we're going to look at verse 4 together. In verse 3, you can see it, it says, tell about the greatness of our God. And notice what it says about our God in verse 4. It says, the rock, perfect is his activities. 
for all his ways are justice, a God of uh, faithfulness who is never unjust, righteous and upright is he. Yes, our God Jehovah is righteous in all his deeds. He would never kill or injure innocent victims. An act of God must meet three very important criteria. First of all, it must be in harmony with God's purpose, which is always good and just and righteous. Second, it must be preceded by advance warning from God. And then finally, they are accompanied by divine direction for survival. So it must have a righteous purpose. It must have advance warning from God and divine direction for survival. Let's look at two examples of that that's recorded for us in God's Word, the Bible. And the first one is the account of the flood of Noah's day. I want you to turn to me to Genesis chapter 6. And notice here in Genesis chapter 6, this is talking about that flood of Noah's day. And here's the purpose why he had this flood come upon the earth. This is in Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 5. And then jump down to verse uh, 11, and this is why. There in verse 5, it says, Consequently, Jehovah saw that man's wickedness was great on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only bad all the time. In verse 11, But the earth had become ruined in the sight of the true God, and the earth was filled with violence. Yes, the earth had be was being ruined by man. A violence was rampant. So God's purpose was to remove those who were committing those wicked things. But then he gives a warning to Noah in verse 13. Notice what he says there. He says, after that, God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to all flesh because the earth is full of violence on account of them. So I am bringing. Yes, he now he has warned uh, Noah that I'm going to. I'm fed up with this. I'm not going to allow them to ruin the earth anymore. I'm not going to allow this violence to go on. I'm going to ruin these people who are ruining the earth. And then he gives direction for survival. The remainder of chapter 6 tells us about how he told uh, Noah to make this ark. But then notice in chapter 7, go over to chapter 7 and verse 1, and here he gives him direction for survival. There in Genesis 7, 1, it says, After that, Jehovah said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, because you are the one I have found to be righteous before me among this generation. So during this, this event, Jehovah God had a righteous purpose. Uh, he gave forewarning, and then he gave directions for survival. It was much like what happened in the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we don't have time to read that account. But in Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 to 11, it explains God's purpose, the reason why he brought on this destruction. The people there had become so morally corrupt that when two angels appeared to Lot in the form of men, the men in the city wanted to rape those angels, perform homosexual activity with them. They had become sexually perverted beyond all moral sense. In verse 19, uh, 13 of that same chapter 19, uh, there he gave a warning. Jehovah had those two angels tell Lot that they were going to destroy the city. He warned Lot and his family of that pending danger. Then in verse 15, he gave directions for survival. Jehovah had those angels tell Lot and his family to flee from the city. And in our watchtower today, we're going to see how they even assisted them because they lingered for a while, but those angels assisted them out of the city to make sure that the righteous ones were saved. Both of these events serve as a pattern for what a true act of God really is. Turn with me to 2 Peter. And here, centuries later, notice what Peter says about these two events. That's 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 5 and 6. There he says, And he, God, did not refrain from punishing an ancient world, but kept Noah, a preacher of righteousness, safe with seven others when he brought a flood upon a world of ungodly people. And by reducing the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them. 
And here's the point, setting a pattern for ungodly people of things to come. Yes, those were patterns for what an act of God really is. First, they have a righteous purpose. Uh, there's forewarning from God himself. And then there's directions for survival, how to survive the pending danger. We today are facing the greatest uh, disaster that mankind has ever seen. At Matthew 24, 21, Jesus called it a great tribulation, such as not occurred since the world's beginning, nor will ever occur again. That great tribulation ends with the war of Armageddon, the war of the great day of God Almighty. And it's not a nuclear holocaust. It's not a man-made disaster. No, it's God's war. And unlike those man-made and natural disasters and man's wars, God's war will be very selective. It will destroy only the wicked. No righteous person will be destroyed. It will bring this present wicked system to its end. And righteous mankind will be preserved alive into a new paradise earth. Just like righteous Noah, Lot, and their families, who were all protected and saved from the destruction. Yes, that great tribulation will be an indisputable act of God because it meets those three very important criteria. Turn with me to uh, Psalms 37. And notice here in Psalms 37, we're going to read verses 9 through 11. And here's what, why Jehovah's going to bring on this war of Armageddon. Notice here in, in Psalm 37, verse 9 through 11, it says, for evil, for evil men will be done away with, but those hoping in Jehovah will possess the earth just a little while longer, and the wicked will be no more. You will look for where they were, and they will not be there, but the meek will possess the earth, and they will find their exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. Yes, the reason Jehovah is bringing on this uh, war of Armageddon is destroy the wicked and those who are ruining the earth. And then he will restore the earth to a peaceful paradise. And secondly, there's advanced warning being given about this, this act of God, this war of Armageddon. Jesus foretold at Matthew 24, 14, he said, This good news of the kingdom will be preached to all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations, and then the end would come. Then would be this great tribulation. Then would be this uh, war of Armageddon. And over 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses in 240 lands are declaring this warning, going out and telling people about the good news of God's kingdom throughout the world, giving this warning to everyone. And then finally, there's direction for survival for this uh, act of God. Notice in Zephaniah chapter 2, in Zephaniah chapter 2, we see how we can survive this oncoming war and great day of God, Jehovah. Notice in uh, Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 2, notice what it says there. It says, before the decree takes effort, before the day passes by like chaff, before the burning anger of Jehovah comes upon you, before the day of Jehovah anger comes upon you. And then it says, to seek Jehovah, all you meek ones of the earth, who observe his righteous decrees, seek righteousness, seek meekness, probably you will be concealed on the day of Jehovah's anger. Yes, here we see directions for survival. Did you notice there in verse 2, it said before, before, before the day of Jehovah. That means we must act now. We can't wait until it's happening. We must act now. In verse 3, it says, seek Jehovah, seek righteousness. Well, the way we seek Jehovah is by studying God's word, the Bible, taking a knowledge of him and of his son, son, Jesus Christ. We take a knowledge of what we need to do to have salvation in the destruction of this system of things. Jesus even said at John 17, 3, he says, this means everlasting life. They're taking the knowledge of himself and of his father, Jehovah God. Yes, we have to study God's word, the Bible, and learn what we need to do to conduct ourselves in such a way to survive. Because it says also to seek righteousness. Well, the way we seek righteousness is by obeying what we learn in God's word, the Bible. When we see that we need to make an adjustment in our attitude or our conduct or the way we worship, 
we need to make that adjustment in order to survive. You know, all the things we're seeing happening around us uh, today in the world are really signs of the Great Tribulation is near. Even Brother Morris in a recent uh, video for on a JW broadcast, he says we may be in training for that Great Tribulation. But that means that, so that, it also means that if the Great Tribulation is near, well, that promised new earth is near also. So we don't have to fear what's happening in the world today. We can lift up our heads for our deliverance is near. And remember, let's not blame God for all the suffering in the world today. His prophecies are there as a warning for us. Satan is to blame for all these disasters and turmoil and death, not God. Don't look to man to solve the problems of, that we face today, but look to God's kingdom for our salvation. Heed God's warning. Take action now for survival. Study God's word daily. Obey what you learn. Stay close to God's people by attending meetings like you're attending here today. Those of us who are worshipers of Jehovah God, we should be working very hard to warn others and help them to learn more about how they can survive the, uh, the great day of God Almighty, the War of Armageddon. Let's all pray every day for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Love you all very much. May Jehovah be with you.